Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Brian Johnson. I'm the lead physician in the Cardiac Appeals Department and the Aeromedical uh, Certification Division in Oklahoma City. I'm very excited uh, to be here today uh, to talk to you about some of the recent changes that we've had in the uh, cardiology uh, uh, certification policies. Uh, let me give you a little bit of history on this. Um, in an effort to streamline some of our certification processes and bring in line our certification uh, uh, policies with uh, medical, uh, uh, or medical uh, uh, issues out there and standard of care, uh, we convened a, a panel of cardiologists, some of our uh, uh, highly qualified and more experienced uh, uh, cardiologists that consult with the FAA this past January to look at the FAA's uh, current policies regarding cardiac conditions and whether or not there were changes that we could uh, make in these conditions. Uh, the uh, cardiologists were given specific instructions uh, to uh, use evidence-based medicine as well as their expert opinion in coming to these decisions and not necessarily what the current existing policy of the FAA was. Uh, however, keeping uh, aviation safety in mind throughout this whole process. So let's uh, go ahead and begin and, and talk about some of these changes uh, that have occurred and in what areas uh, they occurred in. So first off, we made some changes in coronary artery disease uh, requiring stents, angioplasties, or arthrectomies. Uh, we also made uh, changes in coronary artery disease requiring uh, bypass surgery. Uh, there were changes uh, in the area of myocardial infarctions, valve replacements, pacemakers, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and atrial fibrillation. All righty. Let's go ahead and start first with the coronary artery disease requiring uh, uh, stents, angioplasties, or arthrectomies. Previously, we uh, required that the airmen have a six-month recovery period uh, before we can consider the airmen for certification, and this was changed to a three-month recovery period uh, after uh, the procedure for all classes. This is a fairly uh, a big and significant change, and the six-month recovery period has been in, in place for uh, a number of years. Has the workup for coronary disease with angioplasty or stents changed? The workup for the initial certification of uh, uh, coronary disease with uh, stents or angioplasties uh, has not changed. The workup will be the same. The only thing that has changed uh, is the recovery period, uh, which was changed to three months as opposed to the previous six months. Now, this is an important fact here. It, this does not apply to stents of the left main. Uh, this, uh, the stents uh, for the left main will still require a six-month recovery period as opposed to the three-month recovery period. Uh, just to make sure we, we clarify uh, the issue of anatomy, uh, the left main obviously is the first uh, vessel on the left side off the aorta, and this branches into the circumflex and the left anterior descending. Uh, at times, uh, the left anterior descending is confused with the left main, so I just wanted to clarify that. So. Uh, once again, the left main uh, will require a six-month recovery period uh, as opposed to the three-month recovery period. The information for the initial certification of the left main remains the same uh, as the uh, other uh, angioplasty uh, um, situations. So let's take a moment just to review some of these requirements uh, that we do have for the initial certification, and these have not changed other than the recovery period, but I thought this was a good uh, opportunity to review these. Uh, uh, and for first and second class airmen, uh, and, and the recovery period has been met, uh, you'll need to provide us with the hospital records, a cardiovascular narrative, a current stress radionuclide scan, a current cardiac catheterization, and, a, uh, and current labs, which include lipids, a fasting blood sugar, and an A1C. Uh, the airman's file will then be reviewed by our Federal Air Surgeon Cardiology Panel or our Federal Air Surgeon Cardiology Consultant. A new thing that we've also instituted was the airmen should also demonstrate attempts to meet the guidelines for modifiable risk factors as per the American Car Co College of Cardiologists and the American Heart Association. This is a new change. Our cardiologists feel that it's important uh, that we look at risk factors uh, such as smoking, uh, weight uh, loss, uh, 
lipid levels and uh, make sure that these are in lines with the current cardiology uh, guidelines that are out there. For third class, the initial uh, certification requirements haven't changed for third class either, except for the recovery period, which is now three months. Uh, you still need to provide us with the hospital records, a current cardiovascular narrative, and a current uh, three-minute Bruce protocol uh, stress test, as well as the current uh, labs. Let's talk a little bit about the follow-up uh, changes for certification that, that we have in this area. The follow-up uh, has changed, and specifically for the first and second class airmen, uh, you'll still need to provide us with a cardiovascular narrative and a current lipid profile. However, the big change is where previously we required that the first and second class airmen provide us with a stress radionuclide scan every other year. Uh, we now just require a uh, plain three-minute Bruce Protocol stress test to be provided on an annual basis. Uh, for antithrombotic therapy with stents, uh, we should be following the ACC and the AHA guidelines. Uh, and basically what this is is dual antiplatelet therapy for one year for drug looting stents and at least for 30 days for the bare metal stents. If that stress test is uninterpretable uh, due to a left bundle branch block that's idiopathic or uh, uh, due to a PACER-induced left uh, bundle branch block, the airman will need to provide us with a pharmacologic radionuclide scan every other year. And they can do, then they will do a, a plain stress test in the alternate years. If the stress test is not interpretable for other uh, reasons, uh, then they'll be required to do a stress radionuclide uh, scan instead of the pharmacologic radionuclide scan, and that will be done every 24 months, and the plain stress test done every 12 months. Our cardiologists felt that we could uh, still uh, obtain good information in regards to cardiac health with a plain stress test uh, through uh, exercise tolerance and clinical symptoms, uh, so therefore uh, we felt that this uh, protocol was acceptable. One of the reasons that uh, this was instituted was due to uh, the current clinical concern uh, in regards to excessive uh, radiation exposure uh, with frequent stress rate nucleide scans. Now we'll talk a little bit about the changes in bypass requirements. Uh, the recovery time has not changed for this. It's still six months. Uh, the initial information required uh, for certification is the same as for the uh, coronary disease with stents and angioplasties. The big change with the bypasses is the follow-up uh, uh, change. And once again, for all classes, we'll be doing a plain stress test uh, as opposed to alternating the uh, stress test with the radionuclide scan for first and second class airmen. Uh, and once again, as it, uh, I had mentioned earlier, if there's a left bundle branch block or an uninterpretable uh, uh, stress test, we'll uh, need to alternate with the radionuclide scan. Let's talk a little bit about the changes in uh, the myocardial infarction requirements. The recovery time for myocardial infarction uh, is now uh, three months, uh, whereas it used to be uh, six months. Uh, the initial certification requirements can now be done at three months, and the only change in the initial certification requirements is if a cardiac catheterization was not done at the time of the MI, we may need to have one done. Uh, this obviously does not apply to a more remote myocardial infarction uh, that has been stable. Uh, those will be decided on an individual basis. Follow-up changes for the myocardial infarction uh, have uh, pretty much changed as the others in that for all classes will now just require a uh, plain stress test unless uh, there's a left bundle branch block and, or a uninterpretable stress test and then uh, we'll need to do the alternating pharmacologic radionuclide scan or the uh, stress radionuclide scan as was previously mentioned. We also discussed uh, a little bit myocardial infarctions uh, from non-coronary artery disease. Uh, and we do run into these fairly frequently, uh, such as iatrogenic epinephrine injections, cardiac trauma, complications from catheterizations, uh, factor V latent deficiency. Uh, and in these situations, the initial workup will, will be the same as any uh, MI. 
and then they'll be presented to the Federal Air Surgeon Cardiology Panel uh, for consideration. Uh, but uh, further cardiac testing will be determined individually, and specifically the follow-up uh, may be different. Uh, in many of these, it, it will probably be decided that follow-up is as simple as just a cardiovascular narrative annually uh, with testing deemed necessary or appropriate by the treating cardiologist. Valve replacement uh, changes uh, uh, were also made. Specifically, dual valve replacements may be accepted for certification, whereas in the past this was not something that we typically did. They'll need the same workup as uh, a single valve replacement requires. And all classes will be reviewed by the Federal Air Surgeon uh, Cardiology Panel, and then will be sent to the uh, Medical Specialties Division, which is AM200, uh, for a final decision on a case-by-case -case basis. INR requirements for valve, uh, mechanical valves have uh, remained the same. Uh, we require that 80% of values be uh, between 2.5 and 3.5 for most valves. However, for the St. Jude's bileaflet carbon valve and the onyx valves, 80% uh, of those values have to be between 1.5 and 2.5. We've had some fairly significant uh, changes in uh, pacemaker follow-ups, which we're very excited about as well and hope that this will uh, help streamline and alleviate uh, some of the follow-up requirements for the airmen. The initial recovery time for a pacemaker implantation remains the same at two months. However, uh, there are some changes uh, if the airman has had uh, a generator replacement, lead replacement. If the airman's had a lead replacement separately or a generator replacement combined with a lead replacement, it's still a two-month recovery. The key here is the lead replacement. If the leads are replaced, they'll have to wait two months before they can be re reconsidered. This is obviously because it takes time for the uh, leads to scar in uh, so that they're firmly implanted and that there's not a chance for dislodging or breaking. However, if the airman just has a generator replacement, uh, we can now consider uh, those airmen as soon as they're surgically recovered, and this may be in as little as 10 days. So remember, that's just the generator replacement. If a lead's replaced at all, it has to be a two-month recovery. Some big changes in the follow-up changes. Uh, you'll remember that uh, typically for years, we followed up all pacemakers every six months. Well, now uh, it's been decided that if the estimated battery longevity is 18 months or greater, we can follow these airmen uh, on an annual basis. What we're going to require the airmen to do is they need to see their cardiologist and do a pacemaker worksheet every six months and turn both the pacer worksheets in and a full narrative from the treating cardiologist on an annual basis. So Dr. Johnson, are you saying that I need to turn the worksheet in every six months uh, when I do it? No, uh, the, the pacemaker worksheet in this situation, if the, the estimated battery longevity is 18 months or longer, uh, the pacemaker worksheet needs to be done every six months. However, you'll send both pacemaker worksheets in, uh, plus a narrative from the cardiologist on an annual basis. If, however, the estimated battery longevity uh, is less than 18 months, then we'll need to follow up every six months. So in this case, you will need to be sending in a PACER worksheet every six months, and then on an annual basis, uh, you'll need to also send in a cardiovascular narrative with that PACER worksheet. Currently, uh, we'll have to deny if the estimated battery longevity reaches six months. Uh, we used to deny at nine months, so this is also a, a very welcome change as well. And we'll be looking into the possibility of making this even shorter. Uh, but we currently need to make sure that uh, we can do this in a safe manner, uh, but we are looking into this. We've also had some changes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, myopathy, otherwise known as HOCAM or IHSS. The change is that currently, or now we'll consider all classes for possible certification. In the past, uh, we basically would only look at third class. And what we're going to do is determine whether or not the airman is considered to be high risk uh, according to some clinical guidelines that are out there now. If they are high risk, their certificate will need to be denied uh, regardless of class. 
and if they're not determined to be high risk, then uh, we'll, they'll be reviewed by the Federal Air Surgeon Cardiology Panel for a recommendation, which is then sent to the Medical Specialties Division once again in Washington for a, div for a decision. And now I'll talk a little bit about the high-risk uh, conditions that make the airmen high risk. If they're known to have a positive family history of sudden death, if they have unexplained uh, syncope, if they have a history of documented ventricular tachycardia, if they have any symptoms of angina, if they have congestive heart failure, or if they have a stress test that uh, shows a lack of systolic uh, augmentation of their blood pressure, and lastly, if they have a left ventricular wall thickness of 30 millimeters or greater. I do want you to take note here that apical uh, hypertrophy and hokum following septal ablation or myomectomy will be evaluated in the same way with an appropriate recovery time after the procedure. Uh, the reason for this is that the risk of sudden death uh, in these two conditions uh, does not change uh, at all. So these are also serious uh, conditions. We're also going to be changing our spec sheet for stress testing in these uh, specific cases. Uh, so the stress test spec sheets we'll be sending to these airmen will specifically tell them not to come off their beta blocker or calcium channel blocker for stress testing as it's felt that this uh, could be potentially dangerous for the airmen. Uh, so this will be a change in the spec sheet that we typically send out uh, for stress testing where we ask the airmen to come off of these medications uh, if clinically possible so that uh, we can have them attain 100% maximum predicted heart rate. Uh, so please note that uh, when you're giving your airmen uh, information or spec sheets or talking to them about going to see their cardiologist to have these conditions worked up. Uh, we also made some changes in regards to AFib. Uh, specifically, the big changes that will now be following uh, CHAD's uh, two criteria to determine whether or not the airman needs anticoagulation uh, with warfarin or other FAA-accepted anticoagulants. And then the other changes on the 24-hour halter, the acceptable uh, maximum average was changed to 110 beats per minute. Uh, we still uh, get concerned if there's pauses over three seconds. However, if they're during the, the night uh, when they're sleeping and asymptomatic, then uh, they may be acceptable. Uh, just a couple of miscellaneous changes. Uh, on our exercise stress test uh, specifications, we'll be eliminating uh, the need to report uh, METs and double product. Uh, these are considered uh, minimally useful in uh, current clinical practice, and we felt that they just confuse things at times for the airmen. Are there any other questions? Yes, Dr. Johnson, I uh, have a question uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the updates here. I've been a couple days out, out of my AME guide. I uh, haven't done an exam recently, uh, probably the past couple weeks, and I didn't see these uh, updates. Are they in the AME guide yet? Uh, currently, these updates are, are not uh, in the AME guide. Uh, we're still waiting uh, for final uh, approval uh, from the Medical Specialties Division uh, for these changes in the AME guide. Okay, so I, I assume that they are in the specification sheets as they go out now? Uh, yes, they are currently in the specification sheets uh, as they're going out. Thank you. I just had a question about the modifiable cardiac risk factors that you alluded to earlier on in the presentation. Is there a specific point where I should be counseling my airmen where they may not be eligible for a medical certificate? Uh, yeah, there, there are certainly uh, some areas of concern. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, things such as smoking, uh, weight loss, uh, LDL levels that uh, should be consistent with current guidelines, uh, attempts should be made to get the LDL at 70 or below with known uh, coronary disease. Uh, also uh, important, the use of statins and beta blockers in post-MI situations where there's no congestive failure. Uh, so these are all areas that, that our cardiologists are looking at and are concerned with. Could you clarify what you mean by a three-minute Bruce protocol? Sure. Uh, by a three-minute Bruce protocol, uh, what we mean is that each stage is three minutes, uh, and we expect them to complete uh, three stages uh, of a three-minute Bruce protocol for a total of nine minutes. Uh, we also you know, want them to attempt to reach 100% maximum predicted heart rate uh, on those tests as well. 
okay? If there's no other questions, I just want to say thank you. And once again, I just want to say uh, uh, we're very excited about these changes. Uh, in the 13 years that I've been with the FAA, uh, this is the first time that there's been some uh, major changes in the uh, cardiac certification protocols. Uh, as mentioned, this was uh, uh, accomplished through a, a very uh, uh, in-depth discussion with our cardiologists as well as in conjunction uh, with medical specialties uh, division in Washington and also uh, telecon uh, with the federal air surgeon, Dr. Tilton, and the deputy federal air surgeon, Dr. Frazier. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to these changes and, and we hope that uh, they help the airmen and continue to uh, maintain a, a high level of aviation safety. Uh, thank you very much.